Welcome to the Ethics Experts, where we're elevating ethics and compliance and HR to the strategic level it's supposed to be. Hello, everybody. This is the Ethics Experts. If it's your first time joining us, welcome. And if you're a returning subscriber, hey, friend. How's your day going? You look amazing today. See what happens when you see what happens when you subscribe to the Ethics Experts. You get a bonus greeting on every single episode. So hit that subscribe button and join us as we change the world with better workplaces. I am here with my good friend, Doctor Joe Satterwhite. She is the Senior Director of Governance and Program Planning. You may have seen her from a uh, one of our most famous webinars uh, on the Ethics Verse, and uh, after that phenomenal performance. There was uh, thousands of accolades. Uh, I said, man, we got to go on the ethics experts and do a, do a deep dive. How's it going today? It's going great. I'm so glad to be back with you. Yeah. So what's happening? What's going on in your life? Oh, man, that's such a broad question, right? Um, you know, I, look, I have two kids under the age of three. So my life is cray cray. Yeah. Um, but it, hey, we roll with it. We roll with it. Life is really good. Two under three, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. You know, COVID was a good time for our family. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you had kind of a pretty interesting uh, path into ethics and compliance. I'd, I really love to kind of start uh, with that. But maybe before that, even I'd love to hear kind of like where you came from. What are those foundational elements that make you kind of who you are today as you look back on your childhood or, you know, your family and your mm-hmm. kind of like those foundational life experiences? Yeah. Oh, I love that question. So um, I am originally from Alabama, Mobile, Alabama, the home of Mardi Gras. Look it up if you don't believe me. <laughs> um, that is where it was all started. So we know New Orleans gets a big rap for it, but it started in Mobile. So um, originally from Mobile, Alabama, I was raised by my mom, um, single mother who raised me with, you know, that's really where all of my really values comes from seeing my mom working really hard, um, giving me all the opportunities. I never lacked for anything. I never wanted anything. I got to do any and everything um, that I wanted to do. And I think another thing that really, um, when I think about kind of my values and things that are instilled with me, I actually was diagnosed with diabetes at the age of 10. And nobody in my family had it. I had no clue what it was. Um, and like I mentioned, right, I was raised by my mom by herself. So it was just me and my mom. Um, and we look like twins, I promise. <laughs> and so we were navigating this life of trying to understand what was diabetes, what, what, how do I need to do things differently? What needs to happen? And the biggest thing I remember my mom telling me is that this disease is not your life. You don't claim this, right? This is just something that you have. And you are going to still be able to do amazing things. Anything you want to do, you can do. Don't allow a disease to stop that. And so that's really how I've lived my life. Like there's nothing that I can't do. If I want to do it, I'm going to do it. Um, And there's nothing that will stop that. But being able to show people that you can live with this disease, I've had it now for 27 years, um, healthy, been able to have two beautiful girls, um, been able to travel the world and do all the wonderful things. It just really shows me you put your mind to something, you can do it. So that that's me at the core. I love to have fun. I love to enjoy life because it's so short, but it's so beautiful. And so that's me. I love it. So where do you think that thing came from with your mom? I mean, that seems to be such a life defining thing for like who you are and what your essence is. And I mean, let's face it, not all parents deliver such a strong message that has that big of an impact um, on their children that they can really kind of build their lives around. What do you think that that yeah. came from? You know, I think it was my mom was raised in, so I like to call it backwoods, Alabama. Um, so the, the pictures that you see of all the trees, there's nothing there but dirt roads. That's where my mom grew up. She was raised by her grandparents. And she really took on that positive, optimistic view of life, right? She, again, never felt that she lacked for anything. She had a very loving home, a very, you know, just just this foundation of of love and caring and and all of that. So, you know, she grew up with that. And for her, it was the same thing. You want to go off and be a first generation college student? Do it. You know, you want to be the first one to get your master's? Do it. And she went out and she did it. And so that's traveled with her throughout her life. And so I think it was very easy for her as we continue to navigate through things in life because life isn't always perfect, right? No, but it's right. as good as you make it. And right. so 
when you look at things from that optimistic point of view, it just makes things easier. And and you don't look at things from such a, oh, woe is me type of thing. We've never been those type of, of people. We don't look at it that way. So I think that's where, you know, it just started from her. It's just in our in our bloodline, I like to say. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's down into, it's coded into your DNA. And it may actually be, I mean, who knows? But there is a, um, there's an interesting kind of dichotomy with people on kind of whether they're, you know, kind of holding the steering wheel of their life or if they're sitting in the passenger seat. If, right. if they're doing life or life is happening to them. I mean, those are very different things. Mm -hmm. And I have had a hard time in my own life identifying quickly, you know, like if we're hiring or something, like identifying yeah. quickly or like with high confidence, people that are kind of holding that steering wheel as I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Do you find that same thing or do you think you can like sniff that out pretty quick since it's so deep down in your DNA? Mm, you know, I, I, I think it's easier for me because I'm, I'm a gut person. And so my, um, I've always been able to decipher people really well, really mm. quickly. Um, that's and great, it's, that's a great, uh, that's a great gift. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it's a gift, you know, of course you don't realize it until you get older. Um, it definitely, definitely helped me through my college years. Right. Um, yeah. making good choices, right. <laughs> it's probably not some good choices, but, um, yeah, you know, it's it's something about people and it's the things they don't say. I think that I really pay more attention to and their demeanor and how they show up that it really is for me in my gut. Like I can tell is that genuine or not? Or mm -hmm. is it something that's like mm, something's there? I don't know what it is, but it's something. So it's right. really been easier, I think, for me. Well, cool. It sounds like you're just skating through life then. You know, uh, hey, <laughs> I look at it like that, you know, <laughs> you, could, you, you right have it. to think about it, right? It could always be worse, but, but you it's know, also, it's all about the stories that we tell ourselves to your point, all you know, um, yeah. I had a friend or I have a friend and um, she is an entrepreneur and she told me what her new mantra is. And she said, it's um, building wealth is easy and fun. And it's like, you're telling yourself that story. That's a much different story than like, ah, this is a mess and I'm just solving problems all day. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I love that mantra. Right. I'm like adopting it as my own. Um, yeah. Because yeah. I mean, it's, you know, there's this other interesting framework, I think, where like we're so concerned with the outcome of things. That's how we measure things. That's the KPIs that we get or our bank account yeah. or the Instagram pictures or something. But like there's a whole series of, of nested spheres that really influence that outcome. And it's your output and it's your outlook. And it's really kind of driven by your input. And like what voice is stronger than your own voice? If you're telling yourself, yeah, yeah whatever's possible. If you're telling yourself I can overcome this disease and this is not going to be limiting for me. Or if you're telling yourself that, hey, this is a country where I can do whatever I want and it's not perfect, but there's at least that freedom or that, or that possibility for upward mobility, you're just going to live such a different life. I think yeah. what I've really struggled with is, um, I just think anybody can do it. You know, like anybody can get straight A's. Anybody can be a top performer. Anybody can do it if they want to, if they're willing to work hard enough, because I mean, really wor hard work is like more important than smarts, I think. Right, right, right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's so true because if you think about it too, right, your voice, you're with your voice, whether it's out loud or just in your head 24 seven. Right. 24 seven. So if you're consistently giving yourself negative messages or consistently doubting yourself and right, I will tell you, I'm not, I'm not perfect. Right. Like it's definitely, I have my moments when I'm like, Oh, sh here we go. Right. But the reality of it is, is that I come back and say, okay, yep, this is one moment, one point in time, not everything. Right. And so if you're not careful in how you talk to yourself, how you, that goes in your dreams that go, it just begins to take over. And so you have to be kind to yourself. I always say this, it's interesting how kind we can be to other people. Mm -hmm. But when we talk to ourselves, we're so mean, <laughs> we're so critical. We're just, it's like, you would never do that to, to a stranger. Why are you doing that to a person that you literally live with and love like truly? Right. And so I think it's, you, you do, you have to think about, what is the perspective you're going to take? How are you going to let that then lead your life? Or are you going? Are you just going to let things happen to you? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not interested in allowing life to happen to me. <laughs> Look, I only get a few years, so sh let's do something with it. Right? Yeah. Let's 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 leave our our thumbprints on this world. Let's let's leave a little dent in it. Um, yeah. But it, I mean, it is kind of wild, though. Like you know, I'm kind of diving deep on this because it is like, I think it might be the most like critical thing for us to learn and to know, um, in our lives, like how to have that right mindset. 
And yeah. I mean, talk to me a little bit about how you've helped other people, you know, fix their mindsets or have you even mm-hmm. had success in, in, in doing that ever? Yeah, I think, you know, for me, it comes kind of natural just as I talk to even just some of my friends. Right. I tell them how I start my day off. So I'm, I'm one of those crazy people that work out at five in the morning. Again, I have kids, so whatever. You got um, you know? yeah. to get it in when I can. Yeah. Right. Um, but I start my day off that way because it allows me to clear my mind. Mm. But when I get to my desk, before I even touch anything work related, I have this journal where I actually go through and I focus on. What are three great things that I want to happen today? What are three great things that happened yesterday? And what is the the positive affirmation I want to leave myself with? Um, And I've shared that with my friends. And it's more of getting themselves in a mindset of, oh, my gosh, what are the three things that I'm really grateful for? I'm grateful that I opened my eyes. I'm grateful that I can see the the world, right? Now, I'm not talking about the big things. It's just the little things. And being able to get people to reflect on that and you start to think about how grateful you are, how, how you know, blessed you are, how many things that you actually have in your life that are, that we don't even pay attention to, right? I think gets you to start kind of moving in that more positive mindset. Totally. The other thing I'll say, look, I challenge my friends. So I, look, Things happen. We'll talk about it. I'll give you a day. Then we're done. Right. Like, what are we going to do different? Right. Right. That pissed me off. That was a bad situation. I didn't show up how I wanted to show up. This is what I would do differently. Great. Have that moment because you do need to actually reflect on that. Feel those feelings. And but then we're going to say, okay, then what's next? How do we move on? Because, again, that's one moment in time. So there's this new thing. So I'm with you. I'm kind of that same way. Um, I'm kind of um, the, uh, well, at least it's not X guy. You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> at least, I mean, because it could always be so much worse. That's how I kind yeah, of look exactly. at the world. But there's this new thing going around where like that is kind of frowned upon. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Where it's, yeah. It, it's almost like not giving that kind of an approach of like you saying, you know, I broke my leg and you're, you know, depressed by it. And I say, well, at least you can still like heal up and walk. Like at least your back's yeah, not broken. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's this new kind of, I guess, I don't know if, I don't know what, what, what to call it, but almost like a, uh, a narrative that that kind of an approach is like insensitive or it is um, like not acknowledging that person's trauma. And this like analogy obviously can like yeah. extend to everything. How do you think about that? And how do you navigate through something like that? So oh, ah. <laughs> I think that we have, um, as time has passed, I think we have gotten very sensitive about things that we've made a lot of things very political that we don't need to. Yeah. I think that there is value in acknowledging what is going on. Um, I do not think there is value in dwelling. And so I think that is where the difference is, right? Is that, yes, I acknowledge that you broke your leg and that sucks. (laughs) You're going to have to go through therapy. It probably hurts, right? There, you know, there are things that you will have to do, but at the end of the day, you're still here because there, there are people that can't say that. Right. Right. And I think that if you are able to focus on the positive aspect, not neglecting the negative, because I think that's where the differentiation comes in, right? Is that people think that because you're focusing on the positive, you have to neglect what happened. And that's not the case. Yeah, it's right. just not dwelling and letting it take over you in a way that it then takes over and consumes your thoughts. It right. consumes your being because that's not a, that's probably not, at least for me, that's not the place I would want to focus on. And I think that you see, you see that easier for people who have a more optimistic outlook on life, um, who, who want to focus on the positives. You have those people that they like focusing on the negative. And I can say for me, that pulls energy for me. And I'm at a place in my life where I'm not willing to to sit in that place. Yeah, I mean, to your point, life is too short, you know? Life is too yeah. short to dwell on the negative. And there's enough negativity around us. Like, you're you're going to get the negative as it is, you know? Right, <laughs> right, right. Whether you want it or not, it's coming. <laughs> so. That's right. um, yeah, so I think, you know, I think we hit it off so much because we're kind of cut from the same cloth in a lot mm-hmm. of different ways, you know? Um, that, uh, you know, I have been told that I am like naive because I'm positive and I'm optimistic and I'm 
hopeful and stuff like that. And I think people who are super pessimistic, who make those kinds of comments about um, really optimistic people, I'm obviously biased because I am one. Um, (laughs) I think that they overlook that we're optimistic in spite of that stuff. Not that we don't see it and we just have like blinders on and we're just like, like idiots, doofuses walking through life, you know what I'm saying? We're doing it in spite of that and we're trying to fight it and and, and overcome it. I just think there's more of a strength to, uh, to positivity than default. I feel like negativity is like the default position. Like that's easier. Of course, of course you can fixate on it. And there's even like that negativity bias that we all have, right? Like I, we all have this, even optimists have it. If I don't have all the information about somebody, I tend to slot in like the worst case scenario, like right, if somebody right. hasn't, hasn't called me back or something. It's like, well, they hate me or something. Like that's a natural right. thing that, that we're right. going to, we're going to um, feel, you know? And so I feel like we have to fight to overcome that. And, you know, I just wonder from your standpoint, do you think that like the, you know, if you were able to put everybody into a different bucket of like positive people and negative people, do you think that that is a consistent like proportion over time or do you think like it's shifting in a any kind of like meaningful way over the last 20 years 50 years 10 years whatever yeah you know I think we see a shift because of the access that we have now Mm. so I think as you think about right so I'm a millennial I was born in 1984 I know that's crazy um 1900 people were still young (laughs) but um (laughs) yeah right right but you know when I think about how I grew up we didn't have access to as much information right. as we do today. Um, you think about it from adults to kids right now, you, I mean, it is information overload right. to the point where there are different narratives that are being played for us that sometimes are more negative or more positive. Right. And because we have so much access to the information, if you're not careful and you don't filter what you take in, you're taking in so much of what other people are viewing as important for you. And so I think you start to see, we're starting to see this trend where, I mean, gosh, you see it in the news now where you have all these kids that are depressed and sad and thinking about contemplating suicide. And it's so crazy because Mm -hmm. when I think about myself at that age, even if I think about myself when I started college, God, I was just enjoying life, having fun, right? Like, Thinking about when can I go out with my friends or, you know, go play basketball, whatever the case may be, because I didn't have all those other inputs as to what was going on into the world. And so I think people can say, yeah, people who are are overly optimistic or, or whatever they want to call it may be naive to life. But I think it's also for me, what I have done is I've decided to put a filter because I've realized that the more information I take in, the more it can sway me oh. one way or the other in a way that I didn't even intend for it to. And so I think that's where we're seeing the shift is, you know, I don't personally, I'll say again, for my family, we watch the news in the morning, but there comes a time where we cut that off, right? Because there's just too much. It's too much. I don't need my two and a half year old worried about school things happening at school, right? I need her to feel safe. I need her to feel secure. And so since we've now created this space where you can have access to anything and everything when you want it, yeah. it makes it much easier to be more negative because that's normally what's coming out, unfortunately. Yeah, you don't I, see people like, ooh, this is great all the time. Yeah, yeah. There's no uh, there's no CNN feed that's just like constant celebrations. I guess right? to, to your point, they've sort of like weaponized the news to be able to, you know, yeah. You know, what's going to get people to to keep watching and that can sort of swing so far the, the other way. It's um, it's pretty wild. Yeah. Um, you know, what's an interesting thing is. We have I mean, imagine what your house would look like if you had all the windows open all the time, no screens, all the doors open all the time, no screen doors. It'd be yeah. bugs. It'd be all kinds of crap, dust, all kinds of animals yeah. and stuff inside your house. And yet we don't to your point, have that same filter on our minds. Gar- oh we don't God, guide our mind. Moment. We don't, like, yeah. you know, and we just let it all in. And, you know, and frankly, I mean, think about this. Like, if you're on any social media, um, you can't control what's coming next. You can't control what right. you're seeing. I mean, it's it's kind of wild. It is. It is. And, and unfortunately, right, we've just gotten to this time period. I think just where we are in the world where people take everything they see at face value. Totally without needing to validate, right? So I'm <laughs> I'm sitting here like, hmm, that's an interesting perspective. 
I don't think I agree, right? But it, it, I don't know that we have equipped, particularly our younger generation, to be able to have that same discernment. One, because they shouldn't have to have it at the ages that they're looking at this stuff now, right? Like right. Some, they shouldn't have to think that way. But also from an adult perspective, oh my gosh, you think about, <clears throat> I was talking to a friend about this. When I think about what has occurred just over my lifetime, mm-hmm. September 11th, the the wars, right? I mean, it has been the recession. It has been one thing after the next, after the next. And then in 2020, we get hit with a pandemic. Who I didn't even know that was a word. Yeah. Not gonna lie. Didn't know it was a word before 2020, right? And it's it's literally just a matter of, you know, how how do we, to your point, close some of the streams yeah. to allow us to show up in a way that that we can remain positive or remain looking at what I can control is probably a better way to say it. Um, because things can happen. We can't control everything. Yeah. Right. Um, but what we can control, we should really do what will keep us healthy, not just physically healthy, but mentally healthy. Well, and discernment takes work or at least takes time. It at least takes some, you know, some mental calorie burning to weigh things out and see through the fog. And if you're just scrolling, those images are coming immediately. That doesn't take any effort. That's just imprints, imprints, imprints. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. so it's almost like we don't have time for discernment. We don't have time to discern these things. We don't have time to weigh them out. And and if it is sort of proportionately more negative or if it's proportionately more like less than positive or less than enriching or less than edifying, whatever you want to call it, yeah. then over time it's going to like influence us. It just can't not. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just said something so, so critical, right? Time. We don't have a time to process. Right. And I will say, I've, I've said this multiple times, the, the one thing that I know for me and my family that the pandemic did do was make me appreciate time more because everything stopped, right? Like everything stopped. All of the things we quote unquote had to do, all the meetings I had to be at, all of the you know functions that we had to go to, everything just stopped. And what was so interesting was that nothing broke. <laughs> yeah. The only thing that happened was I got a chance to sit down and say, wow, I like that color on my wall. That's actually nice. Or, man, I really, really need to take some of these clothes out of my closet that I'm not wearing. So let me do that, because guess what? I have the time to do it now. And it, it made, at least for me, realize we have just gotten into this routine where we just go, 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 go. Right. I mean, we don't even think about stuff that we do anymore. And for the pandemic, for me, it stopped all of that and it made me reassess and, and, and show up differently. So now, yeah, it, it takes energy. If you're telling me I've got to go from A to B to a C to another meeting at D, I'm like, well, wait, I'm tired just talking about it. Hold on. Yeah. What do we really need to do? <laughs> right. And and what do I really need to be at? Well, um, that's a that's a pretty interesting perspective. It's so interesting for me to hear people talk about like their big takeaways from the pandemic because they are all over the place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like that's not the average. <laughs> like what you just said is not the average. That wow, this was such a such a, a perspective shift for me, and I could see all this stuff. And, you know, very little of it matters. That's not what I've heard from most people. Mm-hmm. And um, again, I mean, it's like we become what we fixate on, and if we're fixating mm-hmm. on how scary the world is and how awful the world is, then that's all we're going to see. And then our, our, our lessons from it are going to be very, very negative. But, you know, you also mentioned something else about, you know, I guess what I would call materiality. Like when Mm -hmm. you first start a job, you don't know what's important, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It's all important. And I can't mess any of these things up and I have to hit all of these, these things. But, you know, if the 80, 20 rule is true, which I think it is, then really a small, you know, if you look back on your life and all the success you have, you can probably point to, well, that was critical and that was critical and I had to do really well on that thing and had, a, you know what I'm saying? It can yeah. kind of boil down to a handful of things that were, you know, you had to get right. And then there's all this, all this like plethora of other stuff that kind of didn't matter. And it's really right. hard though. It's really hard, um, especially if you're somebody who's driven, somebody who's trying to make an impact and somebody who's trying to like, you know, take advantage of the opportunities you have in life. It's hard to know, I think, well, yeah. you know, which fights, you know, which hills do I not need to die on? Obviously, yeah. you can't die on all of them, you know? <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. I laugh because it was that that was definitely something I had to learn yeah. um, through my career. And I'm still learning, right, of the 
what do I not, <laughs> what do I just not need to focus on? Right. What do I not need to pay attention to? To your point, what is that heel really worth me dying on? Like me getting my point in right here, do I really need to do that? Or is it just me wanting to do that for myself to feel like I, I accomplished something, right? And so it's it's so right. interesting because when you think about what what is the 80-20 the rule or what are the things that I really need to focus on or where do I really need to show up, you know, that that was a big thing for me. And I think it went back to my values, me really getting in touch with what's important for me. What am I really passionate about? Not what everyone's telling me I need to be passionate about or what people are saying, you're so successful, you could do this, you could do that. It's really getting out of that and saying, what does Jaquees want for Jaquees? Yeah. Right. Like at the end of the day, is it really important that I care that or is it do I really care if. I was heard in that moment if the impact that I want to make is not achieved by making that statement, probably not, mm -hmm. right? But that, I mean, look, that took <laughs> time <laughs> to really think about and to really get to get myself to a place where I can realize that the impact that I want to have is broader than one particular instance or one particular point. Um, and if I'm not careful, I can mess up that broader impact that I want to have by trying to be visible in a place where I don't need to be. Mm. Now, like I say, that took time for me to even get there mentally because I am, I'm the driven, you know, choose your assessment. I'm the D, the red, whatever, mm -hmm. right? Like that overly like want to win, want to all of that. But I had to really start thinking about what is the impact? Because now as I'm getting older, what I realize is it's not about this job or that job, or even what maybe I achieve in that job, but what is the legacy? What What is someone else gonna learn or take from that so that way they are not back in that same place in 10 years when I'm gone? Yeah, that legacy question is a big one. But again, nobody, nobody who, uh, you know, I don't know, like people, you know, in this other bucket of like life is happening to them, I don't think they even have time to think about legacy. No. <laughs> They're like, no. I guess my legacy is going to be I'm, a, I'm in the sitting in the passenger seat. I don't know. Right, right. And and that is, again, it's a, it's a mindset shift of I can't even control the legacy that I leave, mm. which for me is crazy. <laughs> if your life, you absolutely can't control it, right? Right. But you're leaving a legacy whether you intentionally leave it or not. So whether you're intentionally trying to make some type of impact that you want to make, or, or by doing nothing, sitting in the passenger seat, you're leaving a legacy. Right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you can't not have um, some kind of in impact in, and influence. And um, this might sound a little bit more morbid, but that's one of the best things about funerals. You know, you get to see this person's like, okay, this all, you know, this all culminates into kind of this thing. Yeah. And, you know, how many people show up and what do they say about you and what do people think about you? And, you know, um, it can go so many different ways. And our time yeah. here, to your point, is so um, it's just so short, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I know everyone uh, comes on this for uh, ethics talk. And, you know, I love that we went the, this this direction into mindset. Maybe we need to start like a little tour of like motivational speaking or like mindset mastermind group or something. I'm here like that. for it. Let's get let's it going. Let's do it. <laughs> um, let's do it. So um, let's talk about how you shifted, you know, talk, talk to me about. So you went to college and then how did you how did you wind up in this ethics and compliance pool? Oh, my God. Best story in life. I went to Auburn University. So War Eagle for anybody out there listening. Um, I, I went to become a pharmacist. So I actually uh, my degree is in biomedical sciences. And I felt extremely important because I could say my degree was in biomedical sciences. And I took all of the organic chemistries, wow. all of the anatomy, physiology, Heart the biochemistry, classes. all the crap. I took it all. Um, and I made it out alive, <laughs> as I like to tell people. But I actually knew my freshman, the, after my freshman year, I interned at a small pharmacy and knew at that moment I, I did not want to be a pharmacist. Too much counting. It was the most, it was boring. It was yeah. boring. What like was I didn't, boring about it? The, you know, you may have one or two people that would come in and that was it. Did you have anybody else to talk to? You didn't. Uh. You know, and, and me being, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but I'm an only child. And so when I was younger, I actually was <laughs> surprisingly quiet. 
Um, I know it's changed now, but that's okay. Um, but you know, I realized that I needed more interaction mm. and I didn't know kind of all of the other things you could do in pharmacy, but I knew I wanted to be in healthcare mainly because of my tie to diabetes and all that good stuff. Yeah, so, yeah. um, when I finished college, I realized that I needed insurance. And so I actually looked down at my insulin pump and I was like, huh, let me apply to this place. It's a real place because I'm clearly getting supplies from them. So let's go. I didn't really know anything else about Medtronic. And so I applied. I actually got hired over the phone. Really? I, yeah. I up and moved from Alabama to L.A. Um, all by myself. Wow. And my mom was like, you're crazy. And I'm like, yeah, but if it doesn't work, I'll just come back home. Like, literally, that's how I've been my whole life. Right. So. I go out there, I actually started inside sales. So our inside sales department was really working with people to help them get on insulin pump therapy. And so it was a really good role for me because I have personal experience, right? right? We can have the real conversations of where did, I'm a woman and I want to wear a dress. Where do I put this? Well, this is what I do, right? Or, um, you know, I, I'm concerned because I'm afraid that, you know, I'll have really bad lows or go into DKA and I can, you know, I could share my experience. So it was very fulfilling for me. Um, and I was in that role for about a year. Then I moved into management um, over our inside sales teams. And then a couple of years after being in LA, we decided to move to Texas. Um, our company moved. And so that is where we are now in San Antonio. And I helped get us started here. And then I moved into this group that was around kind of doing quality for our customer service reps. So making sure that the orders they were processing actually were going out the way they should so we could right. process them through insurance. And so I led that team. We set that up, led that team. And then this job came up in compliance. I had no clue what compliance was at all. And I was like, yeah, why not? Let's just throw my name in the hat. But and I had an amazing- about it. There was something about it. Is it just the title? Yeah, it was. So it was more of looking at risk that intrigued me. Right. So it was understanding the why behind we do behind the what the why behind the what. Mm. Um, and, and that was the big thing for me when I thought about the role. And I, I actually the leader of that that team at that time was Jessica. Putasana, and I'm going to give her a shout out because she was so critical and getting me into compliance and keeping me in compliance. And so she actually interviewed me, knew that I didn't have any experience in um, compliance, but what she correlated was the experience you have in sales is you really understand what's happening on the ground. Right. So you're seeing what those challenges are because we're over here in, in our, our tower saying, well, this training should work for you. I don't understand why it's not happening. And I could easily go to her and say, when do you want them to do that? When they're in their car? Yeah. When they're like- In the bathroom? How? Right. Like while they're eating dinner with their kids? Like what, what do you want? What is that? It doesn't make sense, right? And so being able to correlate that and tie those pieces together was the biggest thing for me. And so- yeah, that's how I got into compliance. And I started um, with risk assessment, um, helped to run the risk assessment process for our group. And again, I didn't know how to technically do it. But what I knew was the questions to ask to get at the root causes. Um, and, and my boss really helped me figure out how do you then pull this in and what are we trying to do? And, and how are we trying to make these programs operational? What are the risks we're looking at? And so the rest of it's history, right? I, I learned the compliance. I, you know, I love school, clearly. So I um, had no problem going back, taking some classes to understand more about AKS. And, and um, for us, direct billing risk is really huge. And so learning about that. And now I've entered this space into more of governance and and really helping strategy building. So that's the other thing that ticks for me is really building strategy. So I always say when I grow up, I want to become CEO or COO, right, of, of either a medical device company or um, a hospital um, because my doctor's in health administration. And so um, yeah, it ticks for me, the, the whole strategy. How do you build it? How do you sustain it? Because as I think about why I came here, it's because of a life-saving device. The last thing I want is for this company to not be here to right. sustain my life. And so that's, that's kind of where I am today. What a cool um, bouquet of experiences. I mean, that's yeah. really cool. It's very well-rounded. Um, and it's so, all of it is so interconnected. Um, 
I have like five or six different directions I want to go. Let's, let's go this direction. So when compliance first started, it was all just lawyers. Love mm-hmm. to all the lawyers listening. We love you, of course. Um, <laughs> but as I've seen it sort of progress, there seems to be a little bit more, what's the word? There's a little bit more like openness to expanding the scope of who could be in compliance beyond just people with Mm -hmm. law backgrounds. And I've seen some really kind of next gen ethics and compliance teams built like, you know, like it's a startup or something, you know, they Mm -hmm. got a marketing Mm -hmm. person and they got a data person and they got a sales person. And, you know, I guess this is one of the first ones that I've heard um, of somebody who has this kind of a sales background coming into ethics and compliance. I personally think it's all sales. I think everything's all sales. It's all persuasion. We have to persuade people to, you know, exhibit the right behaviors to drive the ethical mm-hmm. culture forward. We have to persuade them to give us, um, you know, to opt into our speak up line. We have to persuade them right. to live out our values every day. I mean, I can keep going with this, of course, but, um, what a hack I think it would be if there was, you know, someone with sales experience on all of these compliance teams. I mean, it would just drive, you know, I don't know. It's like an inherent empathy that sales people have, or to your point, it's like, if I'm actually going to sell something to you, if it's a, you know, if it's a insulin pump or if it's a car, um, I have to actually understand what your needs are. And I think so much of that gets lost in, you know, the archetypal ethics and compliance person who's kind of, uh, you know, they're very yeah. smart and they're very, you know, they're highly conscientious and, you know, people should do things because this is what's supposed to be done. This is obviously a caricature that I'm painting here, yeah. but like, yeah. but yeah. it's, we have a whole, a whole diverse melting pot of different types of people that we have to persuade in, you know, a much wider way. So talk to me a little bit about that. You know, I want to just dive into a little, a little deeper on what that fresh perspective of that sales or persuasion pa- background had on the ultimate impact of your ethics and compliance team. Yeah, you know, it's you're spot on. I think at the end of the day, coming in from a different perspective, and and again, right, love my lawyers, can't go anywhere without them, right? Because you are interpreting the law. But when you come to compliance and it's really operationalizing what this means in our business, you really need to think, have someone who can say, okay, I'm in their seat. What does it mean for me if I'm in this seat, right? If I'm having to, if I'm being told I need to hit all of these targets and then you throw a two hour training at me at the end of a month when I'm trying to hit my targets, literally as a salesperson, I'm sitting here thinking, what the hell? Like, (laughs) when am I supposed to do this? And what you're also telling me is now I have to make a choice between money or doing what's right. And and behind all of that is I have a family to take care of. I have roles and responsibilities that I have to manage. I have career aspirations that I want to do. And so now you're bringing a whole bunch of things to the forefront and you're making people make a choice that they don't need to make at that point in time. And then how does that also not affect the negative brand that many ethics and compliance teams have? It feeds it. Right. It's like, right. It feeds into what I'm like, trying to do. You here? don't get it. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And so for me, it was being able to sit at the table and ask the questions. Right. And I would always say, look, I don't like my catchphrase when I started was, look, I don't know the law, but this is what I'm seeing. Right. This is what we experience. So we would talk about direct billing and we're talking about we know the risk there. Right. But some very basic things of their their doctor is saying they need this much, but their insurance won't cover this much. And the patient doesn't even know what you're talking about. Right. And so we're getting angry at how people are processing things, but they're trying to meet the patient and the consumer where they are because they actually need it. Right. But until you really understand what the process is, until you really understand how things, not how things are supposed to go textbook, because we all know that always happens, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but not, not the textbook, but what is really happening day to day. Let me tell you what we're experiencing. Let me show you what is coming up for us. Until you get a chance to have that voice at the table, there's a level of credibility that you'll never have, have as a legal and compliance professional. Because the first thing people will say, business leaders will say is, you don't have understanding of the business and what we're trying to do. So for me, what was always important was, I want to be at the table. 
I want to understand your business strategy. I want to know what our goals are. I want to know what our AOP targets are. Where are we struggling? Where are we having issues? Where are we running into supply chain issues? It's my responsibility as a legal and compliance professional to also understand all aspects of the business. Because then when I come and ask you for something and it's at a time that's not convenient, you know that I understand what's going on and I'm asking you this because we have to do it now. Well, yeah, and it comes back down to like some level of either competence or respect, right? Like right. I'm coming and asking you something and you don't think I respect you or you don't think I'm competent. How compliant are you going to be with my request? Like you're right. not at all. How's that? Right, you know? right, right. And I, I was telling this to someone yesterday, influence management is one of the biggest things. And I will say as a compliance professional, all I do is influence manage. Right. That's it. Nobody has, has to do anything I ask them to do. <laughs> no, right? But- they they do it because they respect what I'm coming to the table with. And again, they understand I've taken the time to better understand where they are mm. and I'm meeting them in the middle ground. Right. I think the, the beauty of our our group is that we get an opportunity to, yes, comply with the law. That's not a that's not an option. Right. That's table stakes. Right. I'm not I look good in orange, but I'm not wearing it to jail for you. Right. But it's also then. How do we really get to meeting the customer's need, the patient's need? What, what is it that we're really trying to solve? And those are the questions I like to ask, right? We're in a cone of silence room. What are you really trying to do? Right. If you're really just trying to increase sales, just say that, right? So that way I can have now, we can have the conversation of this is what you can do and this is what you can't do. Well, yeah. And if you don't have a clear view of what people's true hierarchy of goals are, how can you ever collaborate um, together to solve the sort of joint problem. You can't, yeah. if somebody's hiding what their true goals are, you're always going to be spinning your wheels. You're always going right. to be hitting that brick wall. Right, right. And we're here again, and I always say this, right? We're a team. Right. It's not, we're not against each other in the same business. At the end of the day, I am here to help you be, to help you meet your sales goals. Right. Right. We just got to do it in the right way. So, um, we're getting toward the end here. I want to ask you a couple more questions, though. Yeah. One is, how is governance and um, strategy linked? Oh, my God. Um, without strategy, there's no point in having a governance system, mm -hmm. right? So governance is really just giving you an opportunity to pull things together, um, really giving you a clear, systematic way to ensure you're doing what you're saying you're going to do. The problem is a lot of organizations have that in place, but they have no idea where they want to go. So we have technology that won't sustain us in the future. We don't, we haven't created a roadmap for it. We have things that, that are coming up from an investigation standpoint that we, we aren't taking into account of long term. Um, how is that then showing up? How could that then show up in the future if different things occur? Um, strategy gives you the opportunity to throw everything at the table and say, what if? Mm. Right. But you have to have governance in place to create those operating mechanisms to help you reach it. Um, but again, like I say, I've seen a lot of companies that have great operating mechanisms, wonderful operating mechanisms, um, but they're not going anywhere. So they're just like this, <laughs> just round and around and around and they're not evolving. And so one of the things we have to be careful as compliance professionals is that we don't get stuck in doing what we've always done and not evolving with the time and what's happening. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, it's easy for compliance to feel like siloed off and feel like they're the only ones who get it and they're the only ones who have these insights and really lose <laughs> sight of the fact that, well, first of all, the real battle is being fought in the marketplace. We're all right. kind of doing different things together, um, you know, first of all. And second of all, I think if we allow those silos to erect, sometimes that um, compliance tail can wag or try to wag this sort of business dog. And mm -hmm. um, you know that saying of um, culture eats strategy f for breakfast? I think like bad mm -hmm. governance eats all that <laughs> yeah. for lunch. Okay. <laughs> all right for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, and the thing you said too, Nick, about the, the business strategy, and one of the things I think that's important is that creating a compliance strategy without understanding where the business is trying to go yeah. is very detrimental. And so it is important that you're able to tie all of that together so that way you can really, again, enable the business to get to where they're trying to go. Um, so let's hop in our time machine. You ready? Are you buckled in? 
I'm ready. Okay, so we're going to go back in time and we're going to find a young Joquiz and give okay. her some advice that you wish you had sooner. Yeah. What is that mm. advice? That advice would be be confident in where you're going. Mm. That's yeah. good. That's mm-hmm. hard though. You know, though, that is actually interesting that that would be your advice because I guess, I when did you learn that advice? Who I learn it every day. Um, every day. I think that it's it's really... I I always try to force things again, being that dominant, I got to plan my career. I got to buy a house by the time I'm 25, get married by this time, do all of these things. And when I hit 30, I realized that I I met all the goals. Mm. It was great, but I didn't have any more goals to to put up, to knock down. Right. Right. And for me, that was, it was shattering because it's like, oh my God, like, what am I doing? I'm wasting time. Like, I'm, I don't understand what's happening. But the reality of it is, is that everything that I've done, because I follow my gut, I follow my intuition, has lined me up for the places that I am today. So doors open without me even thinking about it, right? Being here with you today is a door I never would have thought of, right? But it gives me an opportunity to share what I've learned, share my experiences, so the hope that someone else can learn. But being confident in that and knowing that, hey, it's okay. Wherever you are today, you're good. It's going to all work out. Um, it's, it, I, I love that advice. I, I, I agree with that advice. I always get sort of like stuck in the paradox of, well, if I knew that earlier, would I have taken my foot off the gas? And if, mm-hmm. and, is, and if I took the foot off the gas, would I still have arrived at where I'm at? I don't know. And maybe it's just mm-hmm. like navel gazing to even think about it. But it's interesting advice that you said, because I was really struck when you talked about that conversation you had with your mom when you moved out to LA and there was, there seemed like there was so much security in that. And many Mm -hmm. times I think when, when we make big bets or we're, we end up not making a big bet or doing something big like that, it's because there's this fear of like public failure or there's this fear of, as I say, like falling off the tightrope and not recognizing that there's like a safety net underneath it. But if yeah. you know that there's a safety net, you can really run across the tightrope. And it seems like you already had that mentality on that, that move, which, again, paradoxically allows you to really like let loose and really put the pedal to the metal and really open it up and run forward uh, unfettered, not um, distracted and like compromised by a bunch of insecurities. Yeah. You know, Nick, I love you that you say that because I have to go back to that place often yeah. because it was very easy for me then because I was 20 three, maybe ton two, something like that. It was very easy for me to say that then. The older I got, the more I allowed fear to come in. And I actually had wow. to stop and tell myself, Jaquish, you moved from Alabama, Alabama to LA. No family, no nothing. You did it and you did it. And you weren't even trying right? to be in the movies. Right. I wasn't even trying <laughs> Right. Right. No, I went to actually do just a regular job. Right. Yeah. And so I have to actually take my like, myself sometimes back to that place of that security because I do. We get in our heads so much. Mm-hmm. And it's to your point of right. I don't want to let other people see me fail. But again, it's got to go back to what's important to me. What's driving me? What are my values? And am I doing it for me or am I doing it for someone else? Because that's when the narrative starts to change. Because when I'm doing it for me, I trust myself all day, right? Because I know I'm not going to let myself fail. If I'm doing it for someone else, I'm probably not 100% bought in. Interesting. And and that can make it more difficult. So, yeah, it's, it's again, easy to stay. I have to go back to it myself a lot of times. But, yeah, when you trust yourself, it's it does amazing things for you. What great advice. I love, uh, I really enjoyed this conversation. This, this was a lot of fun. Um, tell us where people can find you, follow you, all that. Oh my gosh, I should know all of this, right? So find me on LinkedIn. I'm on, on there, Joquies McGrew Satterwhite. I promise you I'm probably the only Joquies, J-O-Q-U-E-S-E. Um, but please connect with me. Would love to, to connect, get to meet more great people and hear advice from you guys too. Well, this was a blast, as I expected. Uh, I had high expectations. You blasted past them, uh, <laughs> as usual. We'll have to do something again soon. Thank you so much for yes. joining us. Awesome. Thank you. Until next time. Bye.